All right, good afternoon. We're going to talk about what happens after the Revolutionary War, because we won. Big surprise there, right? Okay, so creating state governments, that's what happens first. And state governments start to form before the American Revolution is even over. And the way our country was originally going to be designed, states were going to be much, much more powerful than they are today. Uh, so constitutions were written because the colonists, they didn't trust an unwritten constitution. Britain did not have a written down constitution, and technically they don't today. So people didn't trust it. They wanted it written down so that they could see it. And most states are going to call these conventions, and they're going to have their leading citizens come and and develop this, the system that they come up with. And most states are going to have a similar structure. There's going to be a strong legislature. Usually it's going to have two houses. There's going to be a weak governor, uh, typically elected annually by the legislature, not by the people. And there's going to be an independent judiciary. More men are going to be given the right to vote. That's called enfranchisement. And they do that by lowering how much property you had to own to vote. There are going to be limits on government authority, a bill of rights, if you will. There's going to be freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to a fair trial. Uh, you have to consent to taxation. And it's very quickly discovered that these systems didn't work. The weak executive meant that everything had to be done through the legislature and they couldn't agree. And if you put five people in a room together and say, what should we have for lunch? You're going to get five different answers. And that's kind of the same thing they dealt with. They realized that the legislature had to act first. They had to agree and they couldn't do it. So over time, the executive, the governor's job gets more and more powerful until you get this system of checks and balances that we have similar to today. Before the Constitution, we had something called the Articles of Confederation. And that was our first national government. It came into being in 1777 when the Second Continental Congress created it. There was one house in the legislature, a unicameral legislature, 13 colonies, 13 representatives, one from each colony. No executive branch at all. No president, nothing they even looked like it. And in reality, this is more like a League of States more than a unified country. Technically, each state would have been independent, but they would have joined together like collective bargaining when needed. I uh, think more like the European Union. In the European Union, all the countries are technically independent. But they all work together as a united front. Now, the powers of the national government and the Articles of Confederation were very, very weak. Uh, technically, the Articles of Confederation, the national government, could settle disputes between states. They could regulate foreign affairs and Native American affairs. They could set the value of money to make sure that trading was fair from one state to the other. But it had no power to tax you. It had no power to raise or create money. It had no power to enforce its decisions. So if a state said, I don't agree with you, there was nothing this national government could do to stop that state. If you can't tell, the Articles of Confederation were extremely weak, and it was done like that on purpose because they thought it would be the best. But they kind of realized really quickly it doesn't work. Articles of Confederation written in 1777, they're not even approved until 1780 because Maryland refused to approve them and they needed all 13 states to agree. Foreign relations handled differently by each state. Each state interprets the treaty that ended the American Revolution differently. Some of them still take land away from loyalists, some don't. Each state pursues its own policy with natives. It's a mess. When you get down to it, there's really only one success of the Articles of Confederation, and that's what's called the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Now today, when you think of the Northwest, you're probably thinking Seattle, Oregon, Montana, places like that. 
But in 1787, the Northwest Ordinance was the Mississippi River, Ohio River, and Great Lakes. Uh, basically, today, the states of Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, that area, parts of Ohio. Um, the Northwest Ordinance, it's going to prohibit slavery in that territory. No slavery allowed in any of those places. There was a guaranteed Bill of Rights in that territory. The Northwest Ordinance that set up townships and tax districts. And if you ever fly in an airplane over the Midwest, you'll notice that things look like a square quilt. That's part of the Northwest Ordinance that still exists today in 2020. But probably the most important thing it did was it guaranteed that new states would have all the rights and privileges of old states. So if a new state is formed, if Washington, D.C. becomes a state, or if Puerto Rico becomes a state, or if New York City becomes its own state, they will have all the rights and privileges of the very first state, Delaware. There's no hierarchy. There's no earning your stripes, if you will. All states are guaranteed to be equal underneath the Northwest Ordinance. All right, a convention and a rebellion. And before I do this slide, this is where your secret word of the day is going to go. It's pretty windy outside at my house, so today's secret word is going to be wind, W-I-N-D. So today's secret word, once again, is wind, W-I-N-D. All right, moving on. In 1786, a convention is called to discuss trade policies and disagreements that the different states were having, and only five states show up. And five is less than 13, so it's decided they can't do anything because they have to have unanimous consent. Letters were sent to request a convention for 1787, and the letter asked that all 13 states would appear. Well, time goes on, and when we get to the fall of 1786, in the state of Massachusetts, the economy is doing really, really bad. Um, the government was run by uh, conservatives who were putting heavy taxes on the people to pay off the war debt. And the western part of the state, they were mostly farmers, and they were demanding the government of Massachusetts to print paper money and the government says no. So in January 1787, 1,200 farmers led by a military veteran named Daniel Shea are going to attack the arsenal at Springfield, Massachusetts because they want to do a general uprising against the government. Well, Shea's rebellion is going to be quickly defeated. The people are terrified and it scares all the people in the country. So in February of 1787, the Confederation Congress is going to meet and they're going to discuss talking about changing the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they get more than they bargained for. Uh, first of all, 12 out of 13 states send delegates. Rhode Island says, no, nah, we're cool. We don't need anything. So they have to decide right away, are they going to do something with a state missing? Technically, they couldn't, because you had to have all 13 states there. It's decided to, that they're going to go ahead and continue work, even though they don't have unanimous consent. So you got 55 delegates in total, representing 12 of the 13 states. Most of these people are the wealthy elite, they're the well-educated. Um, and most of the work at the Constitutional Convention is going to be done by 12 men. The leader of these 12 men is going to be James Madison. And to prepare for this, James Madison is going to read hundreds of books on history and political science to figure out what should be done. Ultimately, it's decided that a republic is the best form of government. They don't exactly know what that republic's going to look like, but they have a vision. Now, there are going to be two plans that are presented. One is going to be presented by the state of Virginia. The other one's going to be present, presented by the state of New Jersey. Virginia wants to have a bicameral legislature. That's what most people have. That's what they want. They want to have an executive that's elected by Congress, and they want to have a national judiciary. 
they want both houses to be based on population so the larger the state the more representation you have and they want it all to be done by popular vote New Jersey which was a pretty small state at the time still is land wise but it has a lot of people today they're gonna say you know what the Articles of Confederation they work a little tweaks here and there they'll work so they want to keep the unicameral legislature they want to give the Confederation Congress more power over trade and taxation and then they want to keep equal representation now the bigger states side with Virginia the smaller states side with New Jersey and it looks like there's not going to be any work actually done well the leaders of the state of Connecticut are going to come up with a third plan and this third plan is going to become known as the Great Compromise more or less it's the same system we have today and how it works is you've got <coughs> excuse me you have two houses you have the Senate you have the House of Representatives the Senate equal representation all states have two senators you're gonna have the House of Representatives that is based on the population the more population you have the more representation you have in the House of Representatives there is an executive the executive is kind of sort of elected by popular vote but not really when you vote for president you're actually voting for the people who will vote for president you're voting for the electoral college so if you voted yesterday and you voted for either Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders whoever it might be you didn't actually vote for that person uh, you voted for people who will represent you to vote for that person it's a little confusing but it works the other thing that's going to happen is an independent judiciary you're going to get three independent branches of government that balance each other and they're going to deal with slavery too while slavery isn't specifically in the Constitution it was decided that slavery would not be outlawed for a minimum of 20 years so that was the great compromise that got us to where we are today now remember there are only 12 out of 13 states there so technically they can't do any of this well, they take it one step further the constitutional convention says you know what we'll never get all 13 states to agree to this so if we can get nine states to agree to it this new constitution will go into effect now the fight for the constitution is going to break down into two sides you're going to have federalists and you're going to have anti-federalists Federals support the Constitution, Federals support, anti-Federals support things the way they are. Anti-Federals, their number one demand is a guaranteed Bill of Rights. Federalists will say you don't need that because each state has its individual rights. The Federalist camp are going to be merchants, bankers, large farmers, people with money. The anti-Federalists are typically going to be small farmers and people living in the frontier. Federalists are for strong central government. Anti-Federalists, they want state governments and individual rights. Both sides have some very good leaders. For the Federalists, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and a guy named John Jay are the leaders. And then for the Anti-Federalists, Thomas Jefferson is an Anti-Federalist. Patrick Henry is really their leader. That's the same when they said, give me liberty or give me death. Both sides, they put out documents, they put out pamphlets, they put out essays that describe their position. Federalists, they write the Federalist Papers. I know, brilliant, brilliant name. They're very creative. The Anti-Federalists, they put out the Anti-Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers are much more influential, they're much better written, and they're more widely read. The Anti-Federalist Papers do exist, you can look online and you can read them, but they're not quite as strong. Now the states begin to ratify the Constitution beginning in 1787, and by June of 1788, 9 of the 13 states have ratified it. 
There are four that haven't. And if you're curious what those four are that don't, it's Virginia, it's New York, it's North Carolina, and it's Rhode Island. So those four states are where this Federalist versus Anti-Federalist argument really take hold. Now eventually, when the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments of the Constitution are written, and we'll talk about them more next week, that's when North Carolina and Rhode Island finally sign on to the Constitution. Now big question, who benefits from this new system? Well, if you are a white male, you benefit very much from this system. If you're a female, your primary function is to be a good wife and good mother. You're supposed to be self-sacrificing and this doesn't really work for you. And if you're African American, uh, if, you're, if you're a black American, you are probably either a slave or a free black living in the North with very few rights. And last but not least, if you're a Native American, you weren't even considered at all in this new system. All right, that's it for you there. I apologize, the video is a little later than normal. Uh, you may have heard some noise during this video. I've got a toddler who's training to be a Tasmanian devil, and he has been a handful today. But we'll talk to you soon. We'll see you later.